Hello everybody, this is Peter Pronovost and I'm going to present to you an overview of this really important STOP BSI program. Before I start with the learning objectives, I want you to recognize that there's going to be a lot of material in here and don't feel that you need to leave this being an expert in all the things we discuss. Virtually every slide on this presentation will be the topic of a whole nother future session on this curriculum that we've developed. So what I really want you to do is take a deep breath, listen, and try to take some of this work in. The objectives that we have are the following. First, to understand the goals of the STOP BSI program, to understand how the project is organized, to understand the interventions that we'll be asking you to do, and finally, to learn who to call for help. You may remember this picture from our introductory session, but this uh, is Josie King, a little girl who died from my, at my hospital from preventable mistakes. And on the four-year anniversary of her death, her mother came to Johns Hopkins and asked me, could you tell me that she's less likely to, to die today and how do you know? And the sad reality is, at the time, neither we nor the U.S. healthcare system could give her an answer. And I believe in my heart that she deserves one. This project will provide her an answer or the citizens of your state an answer regarding safety of care in the ICU, especially around these catheter-related infections. Now that is going to require your commitment to get good data, to implement the interventions, and to work together. But we have no doubt that together we'll give her a resounding answer to her question. Now our goals are ambitious. They are to work to eliminate central line associated bloodstream infections within your state. That is to get the mean rate of infection less than one per 1,000 catheter days and the median zero, to improve your safety culture by over 50% and to learn from one defect per month. Now this sounds ambitious, but I'll share with you, we've done this within the state of Michigan. We've done this within the Adventist Health System and we're completely confident that we can do it with your help in your state. At the end of this project, we want to be able to answer Sorrell's question. So we will be providing you with a safety dashboard for your intensive care unit that looks at how often do we harm with bloodstream infections, how often are we using evidence-based interventions, how often have we learned from mistakes, and have we improved safety climate and teamwork climate. This is the scorecard that we presented to the state of Michigan it was a magical moment where we actually invited Sorrell King and some government officials, as well as the clinicians and administrators from all the state's hospitals to come and share results like this. The intervention to reduce the top or to improve performance on the top two items, that is harm and using evidence, is what we're going to call the translating evidence into practice model. The intervention to improve performance on the bottom two is called CUSP or the Comprehensive Unit-Based Safety Program. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about both, but acknowledge that they go together. If you just try to put evidence in without changing the culture, it's like the myth of Sisyphus pushing a rock up a hill. It requires so much resources that it's not sustainable. And if you just improve culture without having some focused and concrete outcomes to improve. It's like a kumbaya session and it doesn't really continue to engage clinicians. So how is this project going to be organized? Well, it's a statewide effort that's going to be coordinated by your local hospital association. We will run this like a collaborative model, modeled after the collaborative model used by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, where there's two face-to-face -face meetings annually and then monthly coaching calls where you share what's working and what's not. We share evidence and we 
work on this journey together. We will provide standardized data collection tools and evidence because it's inefficient for each hospital to do that alone. It takes too many resources. But we will hope to have your local leadership at your ICU modify how you actually implement these interventions. So it's this partnership with centralized measurement and evidence and local modification. Now, all of you need to understand the science of patient safety that will undergirdle this work. Now, there's a whole session on this, so we don't want to go into it in detail here. You could simply link to that section. But the sciences are as follows. First, understand that work is a system and that the system determines performance. Indeed, there's a quote that says every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results it gets. If you understand that, you understand much of what we're trying to do. The second is to understand some basic strategies of safe design, and those are standardized whenever you could. That is unambiguously say who's doing what, where, when, and how. Create checklists or independent checks for key steps in a process, and when things go wrong, learn from them. Don't just recover. We often need to recover because we have sick patients who are in need of care, but we also need to learn that has reduced the risk that future patients will be harmed. We need to make sure that we apply these strategies not just to technical work, but to our teamwork, how we communicate. And finally, recognize that teams make wise decisions when there's diverse and independent input. So listening to patients, their families, and nurses isn't a nicety, it's absolutely critical. Now, what are the interventions that we're going to use to eliminate central line associated bloodstream infections or what we'll commonly call CLAPSI? Well, the model that we use to translate evidence into practice and that was recently published in the British Medical Journal is as follows. First, we want to summarize the evidence and convert that evidence into behaviors. We've done that for you. There's five behaviors that seem to be most strongly supported by the evidence and have the lowest barrier to use. They are avoid the femoral site, use full barrier precautions, wash your hands, clean your skin with chlorhexidine, and avoid lines if you don't need them. The second step is to identify local barriers to using this evidence. And what do we do for that? Well, first, we ask you to observe staff trying to perform this procedure to find out what's hard and what's not. We then ask you to walk the process yourself to try to identify what the defects are in using this evidence. And then finally, speak to stakeholders. Ask them why it's hard. Engage them in discussions of what they see the barriers are. We then will measure performance and we'll provide you tools to measure bloodstream infections using standardized definitions from the CDC. And then lastly, ensure that all patients receive the evidence using the model that we call the four E's or engaging, educating, executing, and evaluating. Now, the five evidence-based behaviors, as I mentioned before, that will ask you to create a healthcare system in which you make sure every patient gets these are washing or remove unnecessary lines, washing your hands prior to a procedure, use barrier precautions, clean the skin with chlorhexidine, and avoid femoral lines. All worded as behaviors, hopefully unambiguous about what's to be done. We're then gonna say, go find out what the barriers are to use this. And you could ask staff about their knowledge of this evidence. You could ask staff, why is it difficult to use these behaviors? That is, why is it hard in your area to actually comply with, this, with these evidence-based behaviors? To walk the process, that is, observe staff trying to place the central line, and you actually try to place it yourself to find out where are the defects happening so that you could remedy them. Now, in that last step of ensuring that patients get the evidence, we developed a model that we call the 4E model. Quite simply, it, it is engaging, 
educating, executing, and evaluating. And we found that for these projects to be successful, there's three groups of people that need to go through these four E's. They are your senior leaders, your team leaders, that is likely you or the ICU manager or director, and then all of the frontline staff. And engaging is the critical first step because if each of those groups can't answer how this project makes how this project makes the world better, nothing will happen. That is fundamentally, people are in healthcare because they want to help others, and we have to make transparent and explicit how this work does that. We need to educate them on exactly what needs to be done. What are the behaviors that we're looking to see? Then we have to execute to say, how do we create a health system with your resources and your culture where every patient gets the evidence? And then finally, how do your staff know, how do you as an organization know whether you actually improve? And we'll spend a lot of time talking about strategies for this. But in brief, we engage with stories of patients who are either harmed from infections or staff who went the extra mile to make sure patients actually got the evidence. And importantly, by showing our baseline data to say we may be a great institution, but here's what our current infection rates are, and is that acceptable? We then educate staff on the evidence you will ask your staff to execute this program applying those principles of the science of safety. That is, what could you standardize about a line cart or placing these catheters? Can you use a checklist to make sure patients get these five things? Could you empower nurses to make sure that patients actually receive the items on the checklist? And for every infection, do you investigate it and hopefully learn? Finally, what are the methods to evaluate? That is, are you providing your staff feedback on the rates of these infections every week, every month, and do you investigate them and view them as a defect? Because if you think that they're the cost of doing care, if they're in what I call that inevitable bucket, nothing's going to change until the culture says these mistakes are largely preventable. Now let's switch to this CUSP program that's gonna help us learn from mistakes and create a collaborative, safe culture. And before you start CUSP, and really before you start any of these programs, we need to make sure that there's an ICU team, that you, within your ICU, need a team that has a physician, a nurse, an administrator, and perhaps others. And you need to assign roles and primarily a team leader who's going to be the point person for your ICU to the State Hospital Association for these efforts. We need to work to measure the culture in your ICU, and we'll spend many sessions on that working with the hospital association in future sessions. And then we need to work with your hospital and safety and quality leaders to make sure that this project, that they're aware of it, and that you are assigned a senior executive to help make sure that you have the resources needed to do this project and that you're held accountable for improvement. Now this CUSP program is quite frankly nothing more than a shell. And what it does, it's enough structure to create a strategic plan for safety, but is flexible enough and respects your wisdom to say you know greatest what your safety hazards are and what we ought to focus on. So the first step is to make sure that all of your staff are educated on the science of patient safety. And there's a module just on that one topic. We then ask you to identify defects. And there's many ways you can get defects. They're from your error reporting systems, from morbidity mortality conference, but perhaps most powerfully by simply asking the clinicians how do they think the next patient's going to be harmed in this ICU. We then will assign a senior executive to adopt that unit or to partner with it. And what does that mean? Well, that means that that senior executive becomes a member of the care team. They meet monthly with the ICU improvement team and they hold you accountable for learning from mistakes and hopefully make resources available to fix these things. We then say, using your own priorities about what the greatest hazards are, Try to learn from one defect a quarter and implement a number of teamwork tools that best address 
what your teamwork and communication challenges are. As I said, there's a number of sources of defects. The point is that you start surfacing them and prioritizing them. How do you prioritize? Well, we've tried a number of formal mechanisms, such as listing the frequency, the relative severity, the relative probability that we could defend against them. And if your ICU is that sophisticated and you find that helpful, great. And we can talk about strategies to do that. But what is often most productive is just simply to talk with your staff about what do they perceive are the top risks in their ICU. Because your staff have this knowledge. They have wisdom. We just have to tap into it. So you surface these defects and then you sit down with your staff and say, what do we want to start working on? The executive partnership, the executive needs to become a member of the ICU team. The executive should meet monthly with the team and should review these defects, make resources available, and work with you to reduce risks. And importantly, make sure that you monitor and improve your central line associated bloodstream infection rates. Now, how do we learn from defects? Well, we have a whole session on this, but basically it comes down to the ability for you to answer four questions. What happened in an event? Why did it happen? That is, what are the systems that were risky? And to do that, we need to develop lenses to see systems. What could you do to reduce risk? And how do you know that risk was actually reduced? That is, did you create a policy or some process or procedure did you assume or assess staff's knowledge of that policy? And did you actually evaluate whether whatever intervention you developed is being used correctly? We have a variety of teamwork tools that you can select from. The idea is that you have a discussion with your ICU about where there are communication challenges in teamwork and what does this communication and teamwork shortcomings really mean and which one of these interventions might best address those. For some ICUs, it's simply getting a list of who to call at night or on the weekends. In others, and we'll be having a session on this alone, it's using the daily goals. And in others, it's having a culture checkup tool where we simply sit down and say, what is the culture like here and what can we do to improve it? Again, each of these has separate toolkits that will be made available for you in the future. But we need to recognize that this improvement of culture and safety is a journey and a continuous journey, not just a project. So you need to start thinking as the leadership team, how do you build this science of safety into your education and your orientation programs? How do you create a structure where you learn from one defect a month repeatedly by answering those four questions and share what you learned with others? How do you work to implement these tools that best meet your teamwork needs and continually work to improve your teamwork needs. And the details of how to do this are all in a very extensive manual of operations. Some of you may read that, some of you may not. But the point is you need a leadership structure within your ICU that commits to implementing these interventions and learning the science of safety. Now, where do you go to get help? Well, initially, you're going to go to your ICU team leader. That is, every ICU in this project needs to assign a team leader, and they'll be your point person. That person will communicate with the State Hospital Association to get details about what's expected, to answer questions. So if the team leader could then contact the State Hospital Association, that State Hospital Association will work with our team here through this website of Stop BSI at jhmi.edu to answer any of the technical questions that you may have. Or you could email us directly. The point is, this is a journey together. We want to learn together. And we have no doubt that by working collaboratively, we could not only reduce the substantial morbidity, mortality, and cost that come from these catheters. These catheters that consume $3 billion in cost and kill about 30,000 people a year in the U.S. But we will build capacity within your hospital, within your state, within this country to tackle many or any one of the other ills that befall our healthcare system. And importantly, we will put joy back into our daily work. 
joy that has far too long been out of our work and these projects help rekindle what we all went into medicine for, that is to reduce suffering and improve the lives of our patients. I have no doubt that by doing this project, not only will we reduce the suffering and death and cost of care associated with these infections, we will build capacity within your hospital and your state and the country to really address meaningfully one of the many ills that befall our healthcare system, and we will put joy back into the daily work of medicine. But as important, we'll be able to look Sorel King, the mother of this little girl in the eye, and say to her with confidence and resoundingly that yes, the citizens of your state are safer when they get ICU care, and here's how we know. This won't be easy. It will require your leadership and your dedication to collect data, to implement interventions, and to work to improve culture. But we are confident that we can do this together. And I believe that Sorel King deserves an answer, and we're going to give her one. Thank you.